Hello, good afternoon. So um, uh, good to see you folks. Um, so uh, we have a whirlwind set of material to go through here. Um, I'm uh, struck by the diversity and, and richness uh, of these topics. Um, and I will be engaging in triage um, as needed to make sure that we finish on time here. Um, but uh, I wanted to, to see if we could uh, make sure we cover first and foremost, um, a few topics that really flesh out um, those that we've been talking about more fully. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be uh, introducing some discussions of uh, particle MCMC. Um, and uh, that's particle Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, um, which kind of unite and bring to full fruition um, uh, MCMC and uh, particle filtering. Um, and in some ways, um, serve as kind of a capstone of that side of things. Um, we'll then talk about a case study on, on opioid abuse. So we'll just look at that quickly, much as we looked at the, uh, the, the mosquito um, uh, dynamics example quickly. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll really focus on uh, these techniques, which um, are kind of less model-based. Um, they don't put their trust into to models. And I may have to sacrifice a shadow manifold reconstruction. I think I'll probably have to have to sacrifice that. It's a cool topic, but we probably don't have time to, to really go into it. And I'll, I'll think I'll invest instead in issues having to do with um, model structure discovery and ways in which models can clue us into, can help us identify um, and help us pin down aspects of, of model structure. Um, and I'll particularly talk about the role of connections, architectures, and deep learning in that context, <clears throat> which points to some really exciting and, and cutting edge work. Um, and I, I really wanna be sure to, to finish up with some discussion of uh, sort of trade-offs between methods. Um, so with that preface of the afternoon, I'm, I'm uh, just going to to jump into PMCMC. Um, so uh, this is a topic which has enormous depth, but which can be communicated in its essentials, I find, fairly quickly because of what we've already accomplished. Um, it's as if you are on a, um, you know, most of the way up the peak of Mount Everest, and you just have to climb a little bit more to get to the actual, the actual summit. Um, so we've been talking about methods uh, of two broad types within the recent lectures. Some have focused on parameter inference. We saw that with calibration, first of all, and then approximate Bayesian computation, then MCMC. These were focused on finding the numerical assumptions about parameter values that would allow the model to best match observed data from the world. And uh, all three of these um, lent the model faith about that it fundamentally was, um, was capturing the dynamics of the situation and, uh, and sought to match parameter values that would, would take, that, um, uh, take that faith and, and figure out how to best best align it with observed data, take it as a given though. Uh, MCMC was particularly for de deterministic systems. By contrast, we saw a, a set of techniques focused on latent state inference or filtering. Um, these are techniques that date back um, for their core use for more than half a century now. Um, the 1960s, the uh, work of Rudolf Kalman um, and are embedded thoroughly in our society all around us as, as operational tools. Um, they are uh, the working horses of, um, of systems that bring together sensor data and some characterization of the current system, the current, current dynamics of a system in ways that clue us in, whether it's our Roombas on the floor or, or 
you know, our smartphone GPS systems or our autonomous vehicles or, uh, or, or airplanes or uh, rockets going to the moon or, or God forbid, missiles. Um, you know, all of them use these techniques and they're typically based on common filtering. Um, those techniques bring together observations from the world with some understanding of the natural governing factors in the model, but in a way that represents a, a stochastic system, represents the fact that our understanding of the system's behavior is, is, is imperfect too. It has some wiggle room. It has some stochastics associated with it. Coleman filter provide a technique for doing that in kind of a crude way of, of getting a single best estimate. Um, uh, but particle filtering goes far beyond that. Um, uh, it allows for this diversity of perspectives on the current situation, these dissenting voices, which sometimes are rewarded even though originally they're crying in the wilderness. Um, particle filtering uh, provides this way of bringing together observed data, not with just one understanding of the current state in some wiggle room, but many different understandings and rewards those that are consistently, con yeah, that, that have good consistency, that maintain high fidelity to this observed data from the world. Those, those particles are elevated. Initially, maybe they'll be under-recognized, but at some point they got it, they called it earliest and here's all the evidence that the outbreak's actually indeed occurring and, and they get rewarded. Um, they were a naysayer, but they prove prescient. Um, so particle filtering um, provided this way of characterizing a, a system's evolution um, in a stochastic way, in a way that wasn't certain, didn't put all our eggs in one basket, in which allowed for this diversity of views of what is the contact rate between kids and kids, or just how more hygienic are adults compared to kids in terms of risk of measles transmission, et cetera. Um, and we saw that it can provide a really powerful way of assessing a, you know, a, a, a distribution over the, the current situation where that, that distribution evolves as dynamics goes forward and as our data from the world changes our interpretation of the situation. But to unite these all, to bring the best of particle filtering with the best of the most sophisticated approach examined over here, MCMC, is particle MCMC fittingly in a keystone role there. Um, so you may recall that MCMC um, involved this kind of sampling in a distribution. We wanted to draw points from this distribution with the probability of getting each point um, proportional to its, to its probability shown. Um, so we wanna be able to draw things, get lots of samples from this region, but very few from this, very few, you know, somewhat few from this lots from here, even more from here. That was the idea. And the way in which we did it was we had kind of a current point and then we had a candidate point and um, we're based at a certain place. This is the Markov chain. We're at a certain point in the so-called Markov chain. We pick, pick a nearby point, draw from a distribution, draw a theta star, typically just kind of a, a perturbation, a nearby point to this one. Like we we, we take a nearby point as drawing from a displacement given by a normal distribution. And that gives us a candidate. And then we ask, how likely is that candidate in light of the data compared to this one? And if it's really a lot more like, or if it's equal or more likely, we'll definitely go there. If it's less likely, we may go there with a certain probability. You may, you may remember that. And that guaranteed that we tended to spend more time in these areas, but we still would sometimes go down here with certain probabilities and explore elsewhere. And it's guaranteed to sample this proportion or the probability proportional to this posterior distribution. That was the idea with MCMC. And there was a little algorithm like that. It, it flipped a coin and, and if the coin was such that, you know, it was less than the ratio of this and this or, or the minimum of that and one, we, uh, we will go here, otherwise we wouldn't. And, and, and that's, we always had a current point where we are and we're emitting these samples. If we don't move, we just, um, e we just emit where we are now. If we do move, that becomes our new current point. We emit it and we, we start going from there next time. 
Um, that was the idea with uh, MCMC, and that would be a very useful intuition to draw on for particle MCMC. Let's talk about particle MCMC. So particle MCMC um, is a technique that really combines these two. Um, particle filtering provided a way of estimating the latent state of the system, meaning the, the sort of full state, the underlying state of the system in light of the data. It says, look, in light of this data over time, what's the state of the system? Not just now, but what has it been? What, what's, what's the story of the system? What has it been and, and how has it evolved in light of the fixed parameter values? Now, we had some dynamic parameter values, some ones that are evolving but those are just part of system state. We just fused those as, as part of this, this latent, latent state, but they were evolving over time. Particle MCMC um, uh, takes, takes this and it's like it's combined with this. Now we are sampling from, from the parameters as well. So we're sampling from parameters and the latent state in light of this. We're trying to find what is this data telling us about the parameters and the current state of the system because we're dealing with a stochastic system, um, a system that's stochastic. It should say stochastic. This is all stochastic. It's, you know, even if we know the parameters, we're not sure what the state is. So we, we want to estimate the state. You know, the upgrade could have been sooner, it could have been later. We're not sure. We're not sure how people's behavior evolved. And so we want to re-estimate the state. We don't want to just assume that this model, like in PMCMC, you know, correctly characterized. The situation we want to we know that things are uncertain out there in the world and we want to be constantly regrounded that's what particle filtering did and that's what this does here for estimating the latent state and it estimates the parameter values but the parameters are not purely enough because it's stochastic so it samples from it, it estimates the joint distributions of the parameters the assumption about the parameters in the system state what's going on there right now it's high computational expense. Um, commonly, we take a thousand plus MCMC, MCMC iterations. Each MCMC iteration requires running particle filtering. And uh, each particle in the particle filtering model was, um, runs, runs sort of this model forward, right? It's a particle and it runs it forward. Um, and the good news here is that a lot of this is parallelizable, meaning it can be run in parallel concurrently. It doesn't have to be run one after the other after the other. Even the particles can run in, in parallel. And my student Lu J. Duan has shown, you know, taking advantage of that can speed it up by dozens to hundreds of times for the types of particles we number of particle counts, and particle complements we run with. PMCMC is actually a family of algorithms. And what I'm talking about is the most popular and the most powerful, in my view, or the most, the most clear and, and actionable the particle and marginal MCMC. Um, uh, so, so, you know, the, the overall idea, and this is courtesy of, of Lugia, um, uh, Lugia Duan, um, uh, we, we have a situation where we've got uh, a, we start from a certain guess for the parameter values, we form particle filter. When you calculate a likelihood um, for the posterior, for the new, for the candidate, um, and we compare that with, with uh, this point, and, that, and that's made possible by performing the particle filtering, and we accept or reject. Um, and I, I have a, a sort of adjustment to that old diagram here. So we're at a current point with a certain theta, that's a certain set of assumptions about the parameters, and a certain value of the latent state. This is actually a trajectory that we've simulated. So something we think is the case. And we have a value that we estimated for this value. So the, we have a value for this probability. We draw a, per, a, uh, a perturbation to that parameter. We draw a parameter that's nearby just like we did in MCMC, draw it from like a normal distribution um, added to this, a zero mean normal distribution. So we draw it from a nearby point 
And then we perform particle filtering. And it turns out that samples this one. That samples this, this, um, um, this trajectory, a single trajectory. And we assess the probability of this. Um, and then we compare these two. And, and we accept it if this one is at least as big as that one. And we, uh, for sure, we accept it. Uh, otherwise, if this one's smaller than this one, if it were down here, we look at the ratio and we accept it with that probability. Um, that's, the, that's the idea. Um, and uh, uh, PMCMC has the flavor of MCMC in the sense that you're kind of wandering around this space and sampling different parameter values. But you're also sampling from latent states of the system, from sort of a full saying, this is the situation of the underlying model right now, but, or you know, over all these times, I should say, boom, um, that goes along with this parameter. So you're simulating, you're sampling for both of them. You accept or reject. If, if you accept, you go there. If you reject, you repeat the current thing. And, and then you propose a new candidate. Uh, over here, kind of you initialize, you have some prior, you have a measurement that updates to the posterior. This is for particle filtering. Each one of these involves particle filtering. You have a prior distribution with things of different weights. You have a measurement and you boost the weights of the ones that are most consistent with the measurement. You can resample, et cetera. Um, and uh, these parameters are being sampled too. Each parameter is accompanied by a sample of the latent state that is together with the, um, that parameter. So you're performing MCMC. Um, and each time, each time you sample, you particle filter. And that gives you all the information you need to get a trajectory from it, a, a story of what's happened over time. At time zero, you know, we had this many people susceptible, this many people infected, this many people exposed, blah, blah, blah. Time one, we had this many people susceptible, this many people exposed, this many people infected, whatever. Um, this many people in severe suicidal ideation, this many in, in, um, in uh, you know, non-concrete suicidal ideation, this many um, and not suffering from suicidal ideation. Um, we, we, we sample a, a trajectory. I mean that the state of the system at each point in time. That's what's sampled by particle filtering when, when we perform the particle filtering. Um, and we also, it also computes the posterior value for this, this data and, and the sampled trajectory. And, uh, and having so done that, um, you'll be able to then figure out do you, you know, what this value is, and then you can compare the two when you accept or reject with that appropriate probability. That's the idea. That's the idea. Um, and I won't go into this in detail. I've explained it uh, you know, at, in its basics. It, it's not obvious, but it is true that performing particle filtering will allow you to compute this information needed to compute this value. So in order to compute this value and to sample from this latent state, it turns out you need to perform particle filtering. Um, and, and, and that's all part of it. Now, a key component of this is sampling from trajectory. This is not just sampling at a one point in time, it's sampling the state at all points in time. Um, and, and this is markedly different be difference between it sampling it cross-sectionally. Um, you know, we, we saw in that earlier presentation, and, and I'm going to sort of break my stride here just to show you um, this, uh, this beautiful work again that, that Xiao Yan did and just view one of these graphs, right? I mean, when we look at this, we, we tend to think of it cross-sectionally, how many people are susceptible at this time. And maybe if we stretch our mind, we could think of it as a distribution. There's so and so many susceptible and exposed and infective in a, in a joint distribution in some sort of four-dimensional space, S-E-I-R. Um, but, um, but that's doing a, dis, a, 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 it's not, 
it's doing a disservice. And in fact, we're not exploiting the full generality of even particle filtering. What particle filtering can give us is not merely a cross-sectional depiction. It can give us a longitudinal depiction. It can tell a story of the evolution over time. And I would ask you to, re to reflect back when we saw hidden Markov models. And with hidden Markov models, um, we had this Viterbi algorithm. The Viterbi algorithm could tell us for each time step in what state were we located. It could tell a, a, a consistent story, a consistent story about in what state we were located that followed the legal evolution of the system. And particle filtering can actually, if you ask it to, sample a history, sample a story, a consistent story at time zero, this was the case, time one, that was the case, this time, this was the case, and so on. Consistent because they're all from the same lineage. That's how it evolved from time point to time point. That's what I mean by sampling a trajectory. It's not merely asking what is the case here right now. It's asking what was the case earlier? Tell me the story of what happened. Tell me your best guess to the story of what played out over time. You know, it'd be as if someone could write down the story of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan. On this day, this many people were infected, susceptible, et cetera. The next day, that many or what have you. It'd be a, a sort of a, a, a biography of the province or something like that. Um, Okay, so um, sampling a trajectory is a need here. You have to sample from the full path of the state over time. You have to sample from the state at different times. And, and this is notably different. And it lets us infer what's going on at an earlier time in light of hindsight, on the basis of hindsight, um, uh, in, in light of data since that point. Um, uh, and Sampling from particles, uh, you know, traditionally at the current time takes uh, all the historical data from the beginning till now. But if you're operating retrospectively, you could consider data, what was going on earlier based, based on data since then. And we can reconstruct the full trajectories of how it was over time in light of earlier and, light, and later data. Uh, if we're doing it retrospectively from time t, we can use all the time till time t to know what was going on at, at earlier times, even if they lay before t. Um, and uh, it turns out that in particle filtering, we have a way of doing this, sampling particles by weight at the final time point. And to do that, we make use of something called the ancestry matrices. Um, so this is kind of our genealogy of each particle. Each particle keeps a record of its genealogy. You know, who begat whom in its history? Um, you know, um, that uh, who was my mother and who was her mother and who was her mother, uh, all the way back to Lilith or whatever, um, uh, all, the way, all the way back. Um, asking, asking, where, what was my genealogy? What was my lineage? Each particle maintains this in something called the ancestry matrices. And you can imagine there's quite a bit of, of action that takes place when resampling takes place, because there's this kind of shuffling that go on where certain ones are, are cloned and others die out. And, and, but for any particle that's here, there's an ancestry for it. There's a lineage for it. And several of them, some of them share lineages, just like, you know, um, myself and my cousin, we have common grandparents or, or you know, myself and my second cousin have, um, uh, have, have common great grandparents or what have you. Um, uh, so this is, um, this is what ancestry matrices allow you to combine. And it's, it's really just some bookkeeping. Um, uh, and Shayan did a great job with ancestry matrices. It can be used for particle filtering. It turns out you have to use it for particle MCMC because we have to sample from trajectories. Um, uh, so um, we're sampling from these trajectories and, and this can allow us to kind of understand 
the story of what's gone on over time. Um, and maintaining this ancestral information does require space. Um, it requires a fair bit of space to maintain because you've got a lot of particles. You got a lot of time points potentially. Um, and for each time point, um, you know, there's going to be a certain lineage of this particle which had a full state associated with it. And um, this can take space to represent, but it allows for sampling these trajectories, one or more of them. If you, if you sample cross-sectionally, you know, uh, at different times, um, you may get a picture of what was going on time t, time t minus one, time t minus two, you know, two days earlier, three days earlier, but it won't necessarily be a consistent story. If you sample one time from each of them, it might be a discombobulated story, but, um, but this will give you a, a consistent story. So particle filtering is a high computational cost. Um, um, and this is one of the reasons we maintain our own infrastructure for this. Um, and uh, we, we treat it as a high performance computing problem. Um, uh, but it's highly parallelizable. There's many components that we can run in parallel. You don't have to run it one after the other after the other. We can handle it all um, uh, at first. But it, it is notable that we're performing a particle filter for each MCMC iteration. We typically we have to do 2,000 iterations um, um, or, or more. Um, so I, I won't bore you with this, but the basic gist is if you use things that are called GPUs that are normally wasting their, I mean, they're using, like, producing tons of greenhouse gases for needless reason, burning energy just to, to, to do bit, you know, uh, crypto mining for Bitcoin and, and you know, s silly things like that. Um, uh, uh, probably there are now lots of on the market based on the, the collapse of the crypto uh, market, but I, cryptocurrency market, but um, uh, for a long time, you could barely buy GPUs at anything close to a reasonable price because they were just so overpriced due to, you know, people mining Bitcoins, um, uh, et cetera. And uh, uh, GPUs uh, can allow speed up by huge, huge amounts, um, by many, many times. Uh, and uh, these are things where, you know, a factor of 10, 20, um, and even over a hundred could be obtained. This is the speed up here, essentially. Um, and with different experiments, you can get dozens, you know, to, to very high levels. Um, so you can really speed this up, you know, dramatically, um, uh, with, with the right tuning. Um, it's, it's quite nice. Um, uh, I guess I, I will just say that, um, uh, this is a technique which, if you are using it as new data comes in, um, it does require you to, because it requires you for each MCMC step to run a particle filtering from the beginning, you can't really do that incrementally like you can in pure particle filtering, because every iteration requires running the particle filtering from the start. But what you can do is um, get some benefit by reusing the samples from last time as, as the starting point. And, and uh, this is something that can really speed up um, uh, the effective application of these techniques. I won't, won't talk about this and I won't, won't go into that. Um, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. There are some challenges with MCMC um, uh, and uh, we, in our academic work and methodological work, I gave a talk on this in May to the, to the uh, annual meeting of the Citizen Society of Canada. Um, you know, we, we uh, need to tune these models. And one of the things we want to maximize is the acceptance rate. We don't want it to just sit at one place for the entire time. We want it to explore the space, move around that space. So we need an acceptance rate that's reasonably high. 
We want it to match really well the observed data. That's the discrepancy. And we want it to sample very well from in a so-called well-mixed way from the from the parameter values, and that's called convergence. Uh, and uh, I won't I won't go into this, but suffice it to say that there's um, some some techniques for doing this uh, this really well. Um, um, uh, okay, so um, particle MCMC is a technique to take particle filtering and extend it with the ability to sample uh, parameter values for a stochastic system. Normally, MCMC is only used for deterministic systems, right? And, and this allows them to be used with stochastic systems while also sampling from the latent state. Um, it can allow you to figure out what's going on right now in the world. How many undiagnosed infectives are there? What's, what's the force of infection? You know, how many people are secretly infected in the population? Never mind how many are being diagnosed, but how many are, are infected? Um, you know, how many might be circulating unnecessarily or what have you? Um, uh, but beyond that, um, it allows you to estimate uh, parameter values, the particular assumptions, numerical assumptions about the model. Um, so it's very, very, very handy technique. And uh, it can be pursued in many platforms. This is not a this is not an approach we, we pursue in any logic. Any logic is um, is not well set up to, to to do particle MCMC. And again, we have a high performance way of doing. And I've also had students who have pursued it in computational statistics tools that are compatible with R and that can be used from that. And uh, again, I'll see if I can provide some some references to that. So that's uh, a little bit about PMCMC. PMCMC kind of brings particle filtering and, part of, and MCMC to their fruition, joins them together, but in a very computationally demanding but powerful way. Um, uh, any questions about that before I go into a little example of applying it to opioid you know, related, um, uh, opioid related harms? Any questions? Okay, not, not hearing any. Maybe I'll keep the video going and we'll jump right into that. Um, so um, we only have three, uh, two hours left. And so I'm gonna keep my comments here abbreviated, but I wanna give you a bit of a flavor of this work. This work was um, work on which Xiao Yan took a leading role. Um, uh, I cannot, overstate how committed she was to this. Um, I remember she was sleeping in the lab for a while on, on the lab couch in order to finish this work. Um, and uh, it was very impressive, but it was really a, a group effort. Uh, Rafat Sahan, another, um, uh, another of my doctoral students um, uh, contributed to it, Anahita, uh, Lujia, Bryce, um, Yuan, um, uh, also contributed, and Jushin Liu was really my tutor for all things PMCMC, and um, I like to make sure she gets credit for the countless hours she, you know, sh where she tutored me as an unschooled computer scientist in the walking and the ways of computational statistics. Um, so, uh, a bit of background. Um, um, I, uh, I, I have a personal commitment to, um, to working uh, in areas which, um, uh, where I see some of the most um, distressing disparities and um, in inequities in our society and sometimes uh, injustices. And one of the areas that have, has attracted my attention most acutely is um, uh, burdens in the area of mental health and addictions. Um, and um, in this area, we're fortunate to have very good uh, working relationships with a number of, of uh, organizations, 
uh, health organizations, such as uh, here in the province with the SHA, um, uh, corrections and policing organizations, such as Edmonton Police Service, Saskatoon Police Service, Ministry of Corrections and Policing, as well as um, uh, with uh, partnerships with some with Alberta Health Services and with Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, um, excuse me, we have a house alarm going off and I, um, I, 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 might, <laughs> I might need to go up and, and turn this off or else the police will come no matter how good my connection is with them. Um, okay. Um, uh, and um, we're also fortunate to have some very good collaborative connections with, with parties. Um, uh, within the sphere of, of opioids, we've been working for a number of years, and um, I feel so lucky to, um, to have had access to many lines of expertise. And recently, we've been using wastewater to, to try to understand the dynamics associated with um, with opioid use and complementing um, uh, other types of data sources. Uh, it probably doesn't need emphasis that in the US and in Canada, um, the burden of opioids, um, and particularly in the form of overdoses has been staggering. And during the pandemic, this work actually predated the pandemic um, by years, but during the pandemic, it's reached um, per particularly acute levels with thousands um, dying per year in, here in Canada alone. Um, and, um, you know, the history of, 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 of opioid use and abuse um, uh, suggests that, you know, existing public health strategies are falling short. Um, and, and, and yet in, in the past decade, particularly the past five years, there's been quite a lot of, um, work that's been done quite successfully in leveraging modeling um, to uh, inform better understanding and, uh, and, and to better inform decision-making with respect to the challenges of narcotics more generally and opioids. Um, system dynamics modeling is, is the type in which we draw right now. Um, uh, and there's been several lines uh, of that work, um, uh, including uh, from some of my colleagues at Portland State, uh, Wayne Wakeland, um, uh, White and, and Kaminsky, but there's been some wonderful agent-based modeling uh, done as well. Some very, very impressive models by, um, um, by Hoffer and, uh, and, and some with uh, uh, Babashev, another colleague of mine and, and others that shed light on kind of the, um, at an individual level, aspects of drug markets and, and, uh, and, and supply side issues with opioids, et cetera. Um, but you know, one of the challenges here is that these models well built have traditionally faced rapid uh, obsolescence and, and have um, suffered from, from data gaps, especially given the fact that for many models, well, there's data available on things like prescriptions um, and opioid presentations and emergency rooms. Um, there's um, often real market gaps involving street, street drug use, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, we sought to bring this together with, this also was very early in our, our work with particle filter or particle MCMC but Cheyenne had come onto the scene and um, uh, could tame even the most uh, um, truculent of models. Um, so uh, we sought to address market um, data gaps that would allow us to kind of illuminate areas of the system that were not directly evidenced, but just as Cheyenne's um, remarkable work could illuminate that contact matrix here, the idea was to use what data we do have in this coupled system to illuminate areas that are otherwise under evidenced. Um, these upstream areas, these downstream areas where we don't have data directly, but what we do see can clue us into what's going on there because they're so coupled. Um, uh, so the analogy to kind of the, the contact matrix work is not far off. Um, 
because we're having rapidly changing nature of the opioid epidemic, we sought to create a model that learns from and adapts to new data um, and stays current and to try to use high velocity data sources um, and, and data sources that would be broader. So just as that social media data for the, um, and, or social media and, and search data for the uh, contagion of, um, of, of fear and pathogen um, could shed light. We sought to make use of some non-traditional data sources here, and wastewater would be, you know, a good good example and perhaps the most impactful example yet. Um, uh, you know, we sought to anticipate coming trends, so we wanted a dynamic model of project forward, um, and a model that could ask, allow us to ask counterfactuals. And we spent quite a while, and this was created in an opioid um, um, hackathon. Um, also something that was sponsored by our uh, corrections and policing partners, uh, this, this modeling, um, which involved, and I, I won't go into it in, in a great deal of detail, but uh, it was informed by discussion with addictions medicine experts and people within the sphere of corrections and policing and, um, um, and those in, um, uh, who are dealing with uh, delivering care to those um, in um, in in uh, in the population that uh, of concern with that it was using opioids, um, involving individuals going through um, levels of prescription drug use um, at at escalating levels, um, development of 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 disorder disorder, um, uh, individuals. Um, who might undergo uh, treatment, um, or individuals who are um, who, who are now clean, to use a, a term that's often used by public health nurses in this area, et cetera. Um, um, uh, individuals who are um, you know, who are making use of of dealer sourced um, opioids um, uh, among this. This would be. Um, uh, non-disordered uh, individuals, so maybe for recreational use, um, or individuals who are disordered. Um, and then there's some risk of opioid overdoses here. Um, and uh, chronic pain was a big focus here. Um, so individuals with chronic pain being prescribed opioids on an ongoing basis um, to manage chronic pain um, some of them going on potentially to um, uh, to develop uh, a disorder and in, in physical dependence. Um, and one thing that's not show, shown here is that we stratified the model by a couple of factors. One is chronic pain status, opioid tolerance level, and um, disorder history. That doesn't mean that all of it is stratified by this. I think there may be certain areas that were stratified by it and, and, and not others, as I recall. Um, but um, this was uh, certain, certain of these components were sort of have multiple layers associated with them. Particularly this tolerance level was important because the idea is that if someone has developed high tolerance, let's say from use of opioids at a prescription context at high, high doses um, under supervision, but they end up, um, no longer being able to access those opioids um, because they are caught through a prescription monitoring program or accused of doctor shopping or discontinued from treatment by the physician. Um, they may seek street drugs um, in a way that, you know, they think that they have high tolerance. They, um, and, and they get a hold of street drugs, which are potent, but they're, their tolerance level is waned. They're not sure what the dosage are of street drugs, and they end up at high risk of overdose. So we, we sought to look at this issue of opioid tolerance and how it decays over time from use. Um, now, um, dealer sourced um, um, type of drugs are particularly deadly because of the variable level of dosing and um, you know, that, that, that are obtained and the adulteration. So I won't go into the particle theory of particle filtering. You remember this well. 
but this model was 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 particle filtered. In fact, it was particle underwent particle MCMC, and we sought to bring uh, several sets of data in this work. This would have been 2017 or 2018, um, um, uh, and there's a there's a published paper on this. Um, so we brought Google Trend data. Um, so it was focused on Cincinnati, where we had easy access to um, a set of data on EMS responses um, for for, um, uh, for for narcotics, and I believe it was particularly for for opioid related narcotics, police uh, police calls, um, uh, opioid prescriptions um, for that county, uh, drug overdose deaths. Uh, demographics and surveillance data, and and online search data um, uh, was was you know this this key component for different components of this. Um, so we had this data at different areas of the system, and the arrows are not indicative of where it's being compared to. But as you might expect from a particle filter model, there were certain collections of these states which if you added them up would be compared or certain flows, just like when we were comparing searches, you know, for influenza with, with flows going into the, you know, fear or afraid, you know, anxiety about, about influenza. We would compare those flows with this data. Or we compare in some cases, certain stocks that were representing the current state of the system. Um, so, um, I guess I should say um, we've since been working to use this for Edmonton, and I need to credit um, two parties here, Jalen and uh, Amelia. Amelia's been working with Jalen um, with Amelia's uh, background and in, in, uh, increasing familiarity with the with the literature in this area um, to try to uh, inform an adaptation of this model for the Edmonton context, where critically we have wastewater data um, for multiple multiple substances. And the one of, of focus right now is fentanyl, but we also have um, OxyContin, um, uh, and there's also heroin and, and uh, morphine and codeine and so on that we can and, and probably will eventually make use of here. Um, and that's monthly data. Um, we are working with StatsCan in a way that may allow us for one week a month to have access to weekly data too. So weekday, weekend, with the recognition that weekend may have different dynamics. Um, there's EMS data, supervised consumption site clients, non-pharmaceutical non opioid deaths, pharmaceutical opioid deaths, um, chronic pain, and, and opioid therapy dispensing um, as well, which is more, more downstream. Um, and the data isn't available across all periods, but it is available, um, you know, across uh, segments of this. And we're seeking to get further access more recently here. There's a bit of a backlog with this wastewater data, but we're working with StatsCan to see if we can get that extended. We've also initiated through, partly through our funds, wastewater sampling um, here in the province, in our province, um, particularly for Prince Albert and soon for Saskatoon and Regina. So what this gives you um, is, you know, a picture of, of, of what's going on. Um, uh, so we were trying to match, you know, what was going on in the model um, to, um, uh, well, excuse me, this is actually just look at the latent state of the model. Um, it's looking at, um, uh, sort of the, the values uh, in the model over time. Um, uh, and we're seeking to, uh, to compare it with here with empirical sources of data. So overdose counts in the model um, mirror in, in the way you would expect with particle filtering. And it sort of adapts to what we see in the data to you know, estimate the underlying state of the system in a way that will be consistent with this data, interpret the theory of what's going on, um, change its understanding of, of the balance of the distribution of where people are in the states for drug activity as well. Um, some of these didn't match great. Um, 
So for example, this fraction of population under opioid prescription really declined during this time period. Um, but the model was expecting you know, a slower decline and it, it didn't anticipate that it would come down from this period and actually sort of traced it up and then down. And we've got to fi figure out why that is. This is monthly overdose deaths. Um, model hasn't done terribly there. It hasn't done great, it hasn't done death. Back pain compared to what we've seen on Google, search, Google Trends, you know, searching for back pain, um, maybe it's because it doesn't really clue us in to actual back pain levels, but the model was not able to, to match that. Rehab, it, it did, okay, dark web related searches, you know, it, it, it captured some dynamics there and in, in, in naloxone. With latent states, states where we don't have direct comparators um, with, with data, um, uh, you know, we were looking at, okay, um, what level of, of opioid dealer sourcing um, was there going on within the system? Um, given what we see elsewhere in the system, what was going on in, in areas that we don't have data? Um, uh, and, and what was the, the hazard rate from opioid overdoses? And this has a certain ring of plausibility. I think this is when fentanyl came into Cincinnati, for example. And it correctly captured, you know, the the increased risks here. Um, um, and and this was look at, you know, how are people changing in terms of um, going to to dealer sourcing compared to non-dealer sourcing. Um, now we sought to engage in prediction with this model, um, just kind of looking forward and validating it against trends. And we saw it didn't do too badly, actually. Um, it was a little bit diffuse, but it's high posterior region. The area where it thought, okay, there's high likelihood it's gonna fall on this was, was, was not far off from these, um, from these empirical data. So this is overdose counts um, uh, for, oh, this is prediction here. Um, and this is um, uh, overdose counts at, predicting forward from a later time or fraction of patients under the prescription system. What we see in the model isn't a bad match. So what we're doing, of course, is we're kind of taking data in areas where we do have it, and we're measuring some things where we don't have data um, uh, for these latent ones, but then for ones where we do have data, we're projecting it forward and seeing how well it matches. But we also sought to examine the impacts of, um, of interventions. And um, I actually am embarrassed to not remember the details of the interventions we were looking at here. Um, and I don't know if Shaoyan is on here. So um, I, I suspect um, we, we may not be able to get the answer right away. But um, we were looking at how would interventions bend the curve um, in terms of um, uh, what, how many people would have died um, otherwise um, uh, compared to after the intervention. And we found we could drop the overdose, um, the overdoses um, significantly and therefore bend the number of accumulated deaths down. Um, this is what it would have been without the intervention and this is with the intervention. You can see there's a sort of quite a, a, a difference here. So we're applying this to Edmonton and um, we have a, a similar overall um, picture, but what this provides is kind of where, you know, the types of, um, um, the types of data are being compared to within the model, um, like EMS calls, where, what do those relate to? Sums of flows or, or um, numbers uh, from certain stocks. So, you know, overall here, this is early work. Um, um, the work for um, 2017 or 2016 was kind of a grand challenge problem that we put in an entry for. We were very pleased with where we were able to get to in a, a month or two of work, but um, it is more to go. Um, and we're very happy to be back doing it here in Canada for Edmonton um, under Jalen and uh, Amelia's leadership. Um, I'm very excited, particularly to have wastewater data.
because wastewater data provides this picture across the population associated with, with um, consumption of these opioids. PMCMC here offers a promising means of creating these kind of self-learning models kept current with, with the latest trends. And you know, one of my biggest regrets is we didn't have this going before the pandemic along with the wastewater and these data sources, those weren't available to us. And um, I wish we had had them so we could have provided actionable intelligence much as we did with COVID-19 here on the opioid overdose space. And even to the point of detecting arrival of carfentanil in Edmonton or what have you in a way that might head off, head off deaths. Um, we are involved in some of those in Edmonton Police Service who test drugs for the community um, or are interested in testing drugs for the community, I should say, um, and um, engage in toxico vigilance in a way that might allow for community awareness of, of risks associated with drugs coming in that could be caught via, via things like um, uh, wastewater sampling. Um, uh, this sort of technique can also give some picture as to, you know, what the impacts of interventions would be in a way that could have been quite helpful in the pandemic, I believe. But, you know, it's better late than never and uh, very pleased to be working on it now with such uh, good partners. Um, uh, we're also enthusiastically tapping um, not just social media data, sorry, not just search data, but also social media data increasingly. Um, so data on Twitter and Reddit. And some of my colleagues, uh, Dan Lazat from Western, for example, have done amazing work looking at the uh, community discussion on opioid abuse um, uh, among people use, who use drugs um, uh, in the Ottawa area. Um, and there's uh, some great published work that he has contributed in this sphere that, that demonstrates the incredible um, insights you can get from social media data, even in an open platform like Reddit. Uh, and um, you know, we, we, we do think that tapping that sort of data source in addition to wastewater, in addition to these health system data sources and corrections and policing data sources could be very, very valuable. Um, um, and, um, yeah, so um, uh, I think what was being asked is uh, intervention-wise provision of naloxone. It may have been provision of naloxone or supervised injection sites are two reasonable guesses for what this was. We, we certainly uh, were interested in those as interventions. Other harm reduction interventions would have been the same. Each of those sound like they were plausible things for us to look at. And I just can't remember the specifics of the intervention. Uh, Sha Yan can, can refine me, uh, can remind me. PMCMC based models um, can allow for this estimation of parameters, estimated the latent state and projecting forward. And you know, my hope is you folks have now seen how we built up this infrastructure and this daily reporting, et cetera, for COVID-19. And really we wanna do something comparable whether on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, you know, remains to be discussed for communities um, in this area. And that's exactly what our corrections and policing ministry is seeking for us to be able to give these reports to communities that will clue them into risks and, and give guidance about where things might be going and use wastewater as well as other, other um, types of uh, data to give this kind of coherent community picture of, of risk. Um, uh, PMCMC methods allow for, for assessing these trade-offs between interventions. And, you know, there's more investigation needed. This was our first really big industrial strength um, uh, MC, PMCMC model. Um, since that point, we've learned a lot. But Cheyenne did an amazing job tuning this to the level that you've seen. And um, it really puts us in good shape to extend the work for Edmonton and uh, take it to the next level with community partners. Um, we are working with those, um, uh, with partners from shelters from around Edmonton, um, those from Edmonton Police Service, uh, but as well from Alberta Health Services. Um, 
and others who are interested in, in toxicovigilance and helping the community understand drug risks. So um, it's a bit of current work uh, with PMCMC. Particle filtering wouldn't have cut it. We have too many unknown parameters that we wanted to estimate. Um, and PMCMC really gave uh, this nice combination of ability to estimate unknown parameter values with the ability to do the, uh, the ongoing particle filtering and consume rich data sources and tell us how much uncertainty there was about certain parameter values um, in a way that's quite powerful. Um, so anyway, uh, it's a bit of that, that, that risk. Age group strategy, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think this work is ripe for now um, being re revisited and, and re rejuvenated using insights in our work from the pandemic. And the person who's leading the, the details of the modeling of this hand on keyboard is Jalen Mikulik, um, who was uh, the, main, um, the main person who, who helped our age, um, capture age. Um, uh, well, he, he helped take Xiaoyan's age stratification of our COVID modeling um, and, and accomplish that in a PMCMC, a PMCMC context. And, and I think we need to do that here. I couldn't agree more, uh, Hint. I think there's, um, there's opportunities for, for age stratification. Um, um, there may other be str other stratification categories that one wants to contemplate here. Um, but, um, but age should be an obvious one. And I think the, the risks are quite different, importantly, um, for some of those pathways at different ages. A lot of those with chronic pain are, of course, older individuals with musculoskeletal injuries, et cetera. You know, men who have damaged their back in construction work or, or um, individuals whose joints are wearing out or, or um, you know, have, have injured themselves in their middle, middle ages or, or, or older. And, um, and I think, um, you know, those, those are at less risk of um, recreational, um, you know, seeking it for recreational use, but more, more at risk of um, developing physical dependency, um, you know, later, later in life. And so there's multiple pathways to drug use that this model is trying to, to capture. Another factor we're really interested in capturing is upstream components driving this. Um, uh, you know, the community of opioid users um, of even illicit opioids is of many, many types. Um, some have entered through medical means, some through, um, uh, some through um, recreational pathways. Others are more, um, in a state of polydrug use and, and you know, dysphoria and, and are often coming out of a life of, of earlier trauma um, and just trying to deal with the pain of, of uh, adverse childhood experiences and, and you know, trauma um, from, from, um, uh, from a childhood that may have involved abuse or loss of parents, uh, painful experiences. And I think really distinguished in those, and you may not have seen it, but there are parts of the model designed for each of those. Um, I think we want to we want to start dealing with that in less of a reactive way, and I think trauma informed care is uh, trauma informed care, um, you know, would be something that could be captured here in ways that might that might lower the chance of someone um, who who is in some sense predisposed due to, due to trauma, less likely for them to go on to, to street use of opioids. Um, and there's all sorts of harm reduction opportunities here. Pathways are quite sensitive to gender and sex differences. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, we see that in suicide prevention modeling. By the way, um, one of my other students, uh, Rafat Zahan, has done some wonderful work involving PMCMC with, um, um, with suicide prevention. And um, she's on mat leave right now. So um, it, it wasn't available to present for that, but um, I'm looking forward to, to, to advancing that when she's back. And, um, and, and once again, in, in, in suicide prevention, as well as in overdose risk, 
um, you know, there's real profound differences by gender and sex. And um, that comes out very strongly in the, strat uh, the stratified data we have um, through some of these data sources on the screen right now. And I think um, the chronic pain pathways are different and the um, drug sourcing pathways are different uh, as well. So, um, and potentially the treatment, you know, the care seeking behavior may be rather different and, and may shed light on opportunities there. Um, um, so um, with trauma informed care, yeah. So uh, we are very fortunate to have very good relationships with uh, Alberta Health Services. Um, who are highly involved in the care delivery mechanisms, um, both virtual and in-person community care, inpatient care, as well as uh, community outpatient care. Um, and uh, I've spoken to them about trauma-informed care opportunities um, within the sphere. Um, uh, they're actually working with us to try to um, see if we can get some funding in place for modeling on that sphere. And, uh, I think, you know, the, the point here is, as, as we're all aware, um, um, when it comes to dynamic effects, you know, when we're dealing with these complex systems, um, there are these lock-in effects. There's so many cases where, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. And, and if, if you're left picking up the pieces after the fact, after an addiction has developed, it's so much harder to to um to make things right than if you head it off early on if you can you know preventive measures can go just a lot further and trauma-informed care um and 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 care for adolescents that have gone through adverse childhood experiences might be something that would um help divert individuals from going on to to develop um uh you know higher risk of 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 um a drug involvement in that area, which then might put them at risk of, um, of you know, uh, later development of dependency and um, uh, and and risk of overdose. Um, our our partners at Alberta Health Services seem rather interested in this idea of, of trauma informed care, and it's something that um, I think also bears on some other collaborators of our on the modeling front. Um, so we've been very fortunate to work with Janetta Savalaggio and Catherine Dong and others with the ARCH program, the Addictions Recovery and Community Health Program, which is a, um, um, a whole person stabilization program focused on not just uh, on, on individuals who come in through the emergency room for care, but, but um, you know, are, are stabilized to try to ensure access to addictions medicine, but also access this is focused on those uh, suffering from substance abuse challenges, but also focused on, on making sure they have access to housing. So housing first perspective, um, access to, um, to legal help, any issues with the police and, and um, you know, any um, victimization going on, like with domestic violence to which they may be subject, but also um, factors uh, that might be involved in getting them ongoing health care and ongoing contact with the health, with the health system. Um, uh, psychological components of that uh, and support might be important. And, and again, trauma-informed care picks up there. The details of that, I think, really, really need fleshing out. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of basics in moving beyond stigmatizing language and moving beyond... Um, health system engagement that drives people away because of, um, uh, you know, admittedly overworked individuals who are, who, who view, um, view it, someone's um, drug use uh, history as a, um, as a uh, cause for, um, for viewing them as less uh, worthy of, of, of care or, or, um, attention or, or to have their needs downplayed. And that's a real issue in a lot of our systems. Um, so, you know, understanding that uh, a person is coming from a background of, um, of adverse childhood experiences, um, 
uh, might be able to help particularly route them to certain pathways of care, which would provide them additional stabilization. And I think a program like ARCH provides us some guidelines for how to do that effectively. These are just uh, some thought. Um, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, we're, we're doing some work, talk about combinations. So just to Wendy's, um, uh, Wendy's comments, we're doing some work with partners in emergency medicine. Um, uh, and, and so much of this I've just been mentioning, the past three projects are all with people with lived experience uh, guiding as well. I'm a big believer in bringing people with lived experience and, and patient-oriented patient research to bear here. But um, with, with people who use drugs, it's, it's particularly important. Um, and, um, and we're working in the emergency room to try to work towards better capturing exactly the information that, um, um, that Wendy is talking about. You know, all too often people presenting for care and emerge for, um, for, for opioid related, um, um, opioid related challenges are not recognized as such. They're coded as having, you know, um, nausea or coded as, 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 as having, um, you know, seizures or, or fainting or, you know, infection or, or heart problems or whatever. And, and, you know, um, what's being missed is, is um, the bigger picture of, of where that's coming from and, and the causes. And often there is stigmatization, profound stigmatization that goes on, but it's not noted in the ICD uh, codes, what the, you know, that this is an individual suffering from, um, from, from opioid dependency or, or, or substance use challenges. And, and this, this is a real barrier to getting funding for it. It's a real barrier for getting, um, uh, getting clinical recognition for it, for setting up clinical pathways for it, and, um, and for making sure these people have access to appropriate care. And um, so we're working with them actually on some machine learning algorithms that would help us reduce the burden on chart reviews and in more automatically flag cases that might need, might benefit from more discussion along these lines and in more investigation um, so that we could more quickly identify individuals who really need, um, uh, need care. Um, and, um, and so that's amazing, Wendy, we should really, really talk um, because right now we're, we're even having trouble getting appropriate funding from Ministry for take home naloxone programs and um, and your know, programs to to meet the needs of these individuals because the ministry says show me the data the, you know the data is not there for the for the case volumes of course it these are individuals who are being seen it's just not being coded as Wendy says in the right way and I think um, you know uh, AI can help flag things to the attention of like the attending physician in a way that might allow for more reliably capturing that information, allowing extra time to be taken to, to look into this case and figure out if this is one of these, you know, 80% who are never noted explicitly and are sent home without really dealing with their needs. Um, um, and uh, I think there's a lot of potential here, um, uh, but, you know, just, again, points to this issue of the divergence sometimes between what's going on in one area of the system and, um, and the undersampling of data and the need for methods that will let you be robust given those. Um, so um, yeah, we, we're working with AMR data um, um, and, and you know, um, physicians notes, nurses notes, and, and being able to take into account multiple presentations of data, actually, um, data from multiple presentations to ERs to, the, to, the, to emerge, for example, can be quite helpful in cluing in to, uh, to the needs there. Anyway, it's, it's fascinating, um, fascinating area, and I'm so grateful for the, the comments um, there. Um, I could learn so much, I think, from many people here, but we're, we're all working on those different areas of that elephant, right? Different legs, different ears, whatever. And I think there's a lot to learn um, to, uh, to help remove blinders from my eyes. So thank you very much. And this was, you know, one.